white mob in Durban. Each such incident only made him more resolute in his unique struggle of Satyagraha, combining peaceful resistance with self-purification. There was nothing personal about this. It was a struggle on behalf of thousands of Indian settlers against racial oppression. Gandhi founded the Natal Indian Congress to provide an organizational basis for the movement. And the weekly newsletter, Indian Opinion, to serve as its mouthpiece. At the same time, he felt it his duty as a British subject to help the British in their hour of need and organized the Indian Ambulance Corps during their war with the Boer or the Dutch settlers in South Africa. Their selfless services were officially recognized. Gandhi was awarded the Victoria Cross but the victorious British were in no mood to grant the Indians any concession. About this time, Gandhi received great impetus in his line of thinking and action. From reading successively the like-minded writings of Ruskin, Thoreau and Tolstoy. Inspired by Ruskin's back to nature motto, he bought a hundred acre farm near Phoenix in Natal, where he practiced his ideal of community living along with a few other families. A few years later, when the Satyagraha was at its peak, a larger farm was acquired near Johannesburg to provide shelter to the dependents of the imprisoned Satyagrahis. Gandhi named it the Tolstoy Farm. In 1912, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, in whom Gandhi found his political mentor, visited South Africa where the British government promised him reform of the anti-Indian laws and practice. By the end of 1913, some 50,000 indentured labourers from India were on strike. A few thousand free Indians were in jail, all Shuttagrahis. Eventually, the government bowed down before their will and agreed to abolish the discriminatory tax on former indentured laborers. His mission accomplished, a tired but happy Gandhi decided to return to India and send the boys in his Phoenix settlement to stay in Tagore's Shantiniketan. Dear Mr. Gandhi, that you could think of my school as the right and the likely place where your Phoenix boys could take shelter when they are in India has given me real pleasure. I write this letter to thank you for allowing your boys to become our boys as well and thus form a living link in the sadhana of both of our lives. Soon, Gandhi was engulfed in a series of social and political movements, putting his technique of Satyagraha to test on the Indian soil. He became the uncrowned leader of the masses, their dear Bapu, as they fondly addressed him. He became one with the millions of toiling peasants, wearing their simple dress, living their simple life. Rabindranath was very close to Mahatma Gandhi. They believed in the same goals for their country. But Rabindranath did not think as politically as Mahatma Gandhi did. But Rabindranath totally depended on Mahatma Gandhi to steer the nation towards the goal of self-reliance. Gandhi and Rabindranath set up a new and admirable model of public controversy. They didn't try to hide their differences. As a matter of fact, they expressed their differences 
in very clear language. And yet they did this in a spirit of undoubted mutual respect. Gandhiji addressed Tagore as Gurudev and Rabindranath addressed Gandhi as Mahatma. This kind of critical friendship that developed between Tagore and Gandhi is something that has, has very few parallels in India's intellectual history. Dear Gurudev, for my forthcoming address before the Hindi Sammelan, I am trying to collect the opinions of leaders of thought on the following questions. Is not Hindi the only possible national language for interprovincial intercourse and for all other national proceedings? Dear Mr. Gandhi, I can only answer in the affirmative the question you have sent to me from Motihari. Of course, Hindi is the only possible national language for interprovincial intercourse in India. Yours very sincerely, Rabindranath Tagore. A little later, he secured Tagore's presence in the Gujarati Literary Conference, where he himself rendered Tagore's extempore speech into Gujarati. In the meanwhile, the First World War came to an end. The long-awaited constitutional reforms announced by the government for meagre. Close on its heels came the repressive Rowlatt Act, drastically curtailing civil liberties. Led by Gandhi, protests erupted everywhere and the political situation turned grave. The worst was to come in Punjab. On the 12th of April 1919, Tagore, who had followed the events with great interest, wrote to Gandhi, Dear Mahatmaji, Power in all its forms is irrational. It's like the horse that drags the carriage blindfolded. The moral element in it is only represented in the man who drives the horse. Passive resistance is a force which is not necessarily moral in itself, it can be used against truth as well as for it. Our authorities have shown us their claws. In this crisis, you, as a great leader of men, have stood among us to proclaim your faith in the ideal which you know to be that of India. You have said, conquer anger by the power of non-anger, an evil by the power of good. The very next day, General Dyer unleashed his fury on the peaceful assemblage of protesters trapped in the confined space in Jallianwala Bagh. Hearing the news, Tagore wrote one of the strongest letters of protest of his life. The enormity of the measures taken by the government in the Punjab for quelling some local disturbances has, with a rude shock, revealed to our minds the helplessness of our position as British subjects in India. The disproportionate severity of the punishments inflicted upon the unfortunate people and the methods of carrying them out, we are convinced, are without parallel in the history of civilized governments. And these are the reasons which have painfully compelled me to ask Your Excellency with due deference and regret to relieve me of my title of knighthood. Dear Gurudev, I have just arrived in the Punjab and I feel happy that I have been able at last to visit this unhappy land. I am today in Lahore. Tonight, both Andrews and I are going to Delhi in connection with the committee. The Jallianwala Bagh tragedy led directly to the mass movement of non-cooperation, which was launched by the Congress in August 1920 and guided by Gandhi. 
now a popular national leader who, like Tagore, renounced his own official honours as a symbol of his change of attitude to the ruling power. During the non-cooperation movement, Gandhiji wanted support from poet Rabindranath Tagore, but Tagore declined because he felt that this type of agitation will ultimately lead to violence. On one occasion, when Gandhiji visited Tagore at his Jurashako house, some people from outside started burning foreign cloth in the campus of Tagore house. And poet showed that this was the measure which the followers of Gandhiji used to take during the non-cooperation movement. Ultimately, Gandhiji also withdrew the movement because of the violence at Chauri Chaura, and here Tagore proved absolutely perfect. Tagore somehow couldn't accept the, what he called the negative aspects of the Satyagraha movement. But Gandhi was leading the masses and he had to take into account the long repressed feelings of the masses. Now, we have to try to understand the differences between these two great men on the question of the non-cooperation movement which Gandhi led at a historic moment in India. I believe that it is easy to understand the difference between these two men when we consider what they said in the background of their life's mission. What was Rabindranath trying to do at that time? He was building up Vishwa Bharati. He was building up a place where he could invite the rest of the world and more particularly the West to come and meet the East. What was Gandhiji trying to do? He was trying to lead a historic struggle against injustice. In the struggle against injustice, which British imperialism represented, he had to talk about non-cooperation. So these two men, at that time, were obviously involved in two different missions of life. One was talking about non-cooperation with injustice. The other was talking about the meeting of the East and the West. After the Chauri Chaura incident, Gandhi virtually retired from political life, devoting himself to social work, in particular the propagation of charka, or the spinning wheel, which formed a basic tenet of all his socio-political movements. The Charka, as you all know, was a great symbol to the Gandhians. And Rabindranath was somewhat skeptical of this particular instrument. The doubts were of two kinds. First, he could not